Okay, here we go. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Yes. And in the next verse, verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. So they, 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 they leave God out of their lives. They don't want to think about God. They don't want to acknowledge God. They want to pretend he's not real. And when that happens, their thinking gets messed up. They become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts. They're foolish because they're leaving God's out. God out. Their, their, their hearts are darkened. They can't think clearly. They can't see clearly. And they claim to be wise, but they're not. And other people claim they're wise, too. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who say, oh, these guys are really smart. Look at all those degrees he's got. Wow, look at all those words he knows. He's been, he, he knows this stuff, man. He's really awesome. And he's saying, yeah, I'm really awesome. But he's not. He's a fool, that God says, if he's leading God out of his life. And then today's verse. <laughs> yeah. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, yes, resembling <laughs> my man, mortal man and <laughs> birds and animals and cre creeping, creepy crawlies, yeah, creeping things. So that's what people do. Everybody's got a God. I mean, they may be saying, oh, I'm not a God of God. No, not me. I'm an atheist. I don't have a God. But they do because something is the most important thing in his or her life. You know, that's just the way we are wired. It's probably himself in many cases. So he's his own God. He's got an image resembling mortal man. He's got an image that's himself. And he, and he thinks of himself as God. He thinks, I know what's right. I know what's wrong. I know what's true. I know what's fault. I get to decide what's reality. And he doesn't. He's crazy. He's, he's foolish. Even though he thinks he's really, really smart. God says he's fool. He's a fool. And he's exchanged the glory of the true God, the immortal God, for foolish images. All right, let's see if we can say it one more time. Exchange the glory, exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Got it? Can you start it? And exchange the glory, the glory of the immortal God. Four images, uh huh. Resembling mortal man. Can you finish it? And birds and animals. That's it. And creepy crawlers, yep. Birds and animals and creepy things, yep. That's very good. Very good. You? <laughs> yeah, he, he wants all this in comic sense, but anyway, I don't, I don't have any comic sense stories. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's cool. Play oh, away, Ariel. All right. Um, so I don't know if I need to talk about that anymore. We talked about it plenty, and you memorize it. That's good. Do you have anything else you want me to mention in prayer here? Your mama and the family. Uh, you were the one that asked for uh, Brianna, yeah, and her, her trip. She's got a grandmother who died, I think. And Lizzie, your mom. Jenna, did you have a request for a, what, what was I forgot again? Your brother, yeah, he's in the Air Force, is that what you said? And traveling here from Shreveport, I think you said? Yeah. Yes. Goat. Your goat. I forgot to pray for you. I didn't pray for your goat earlier, did I? I remember that. He's going into the Marines? Awesome. So he's already signed up, or is he planning to? Or? I met a son that was a, is a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine, but he was on active duty in Operation Iraqi Freedom in the early 2000s. Who? Oh, yeah? Cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Now, Haley, I'm getting, I've heard so many things here. The last request you made was for Taylor's boyfriend, Jerry, he's the one joining the Marines. Okay, I'm not sure I'll remember all this, but we'll, the Lord will understand. We'll, I'll get it straight. Anything else before I pray? All right, Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for their love for you and your word, and thank you for the way they're memorizing your word as we work through these verses in the morning. Lord, this passage in Romans is incredibly powerful, and uh, Lord, you you just seem to be pointing your finger at modern-day America. We have so many people who are choosing to leave you out of their lives 
and you say very clearly there, as they suppress the truth about you, that they are acting like fools, that uh, they're rejecting you, and they're not choosing to let you be in their lives. And so instead of worshiping you, the immortal God, they're exchanging your glory for foolish images of themselves, often, Lord, we know, and often of birds and animals and creeping things and other things and other people. And, but it's all foolish. So, Lord, help us never to be deceived by those kind of people. Help us never to be impressed by them thinking that they're wise somehow when they're really fools. Help us to listen to you and your word and your truth. Lord, we've got requests that have been made, and I want to pray for Preston's goat, Lord, that that medicine would work on his goat and that he'd get better. I want to pray for Haley's uh, uh, sister's boyfriend, Jared, yeah, and as he's uh, joining the Marines, I pray that that would go well and you'd bless him and keep him safe. Pray for Via's grandmother, especially and that family as she apparently is nearing the end of her life and I pray that you would give her that peace that only you can give your perfect peace to hold her close and let her sense your nearness Lord right now and give that family the comfort they need because it's a time of grieving and hurting and yet it's a time of rejoicing too because we know that someday we're going to be reunited with you but bless that family please pray for Lizzie's mom I pray for um, the uh, uh Jenna's, help me, Jenna. Your brother who is in, in the Air Force coming up from Shreveport, Lord, I pray give him a safe trip and a good Thanksgiving here. And what else am I leaving out, guys? Brianna, yes, Lord, please take care of Brianna and her family as they travel. And I think, I think, if I'm not mistaken, right, they may have, she may have had a grandmother that died, I believe. So please be merciful to that family and give them peace in, in that time of death. Am I leaving out anything else, guys? Okay, Lord, thank you for these kids. Thank you that they make so many good prayer requests, Lord, because you told us to do that. You told us to make our requests known, and I know you hear the, our prayers. And even when we, you don't do exactly what we, you ask us to, what we ask you to do, you do the right thing, and that's what we really want you to do, Lord. Uh, we know sometimes we don't ask the right way. We don't ask for the right things because we don't have enough wisdom, but we trust you with all these things, and we know you're going to do the right thing. We thank you that when we look back, we're always happy that you did what you did. You know what you're doing. So help us to trust you with all these things. Lord, as we continue to look at 1 Corinthians, this wonderful book that you caused your man Paul, the Apostle Paul, to write in your word, I pray that we'll, that you'll help these kids learn in two different ways. I pray you'd help them to learn the things they need to learn to pass the test next time we meet. But also, Lord, help them to learn from your word. This is your word we're talking about here. You're the one speaking to us through your word. So help them to grow spiritually stronger as they study and listen to your word. We want you to get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Yeah, this is yeah. next next class session. Um, everybody got your handouts? Since the test is next time, I'm going to back up to to the first uh, screen and kind of review the things that will be on the test. So, so mark this, make sure it's very clear. You know these things. This is First Corinthians. It was, it was in the city of Corinth, of course. That makes sense. That's the name of the, the Corinthians, and and they had, and he was responding to two things. Some people from Chloe's household had come to talk to him and told him what was happening in the church. And then they also brought him a letter from the church so he could read some questions that they had that were in this letter, and he answered those questions. So his purpose in writing it was to correct the problems he had heard about, the news from Chloe's household, and also to answer those questions and to address other issues that were important that God was inspiring him to write about. So you need to remember those two paragraphs. He wrote the letter, AD 55 or 56, near the end of his third missionary journey from Ephesus. So he's taken three missionary journeys. He's back in Ephesus. He spent a lot of time there on his last missionary journey. And he wrote this letter to the Corinthians from there. The theme, we're the temple of God and dwelt by God's Spirit. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You ought to be able to remember 3.16 because of John 3.16. or This is 1 Corinthians 3.16. 
don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? So we're a temple to the Holy Spirit. We need to let him have his way in us. There's a, usually a question that says, what else did you learn about 1 Corinthians? Well, this is a good, good answer to that. He talks about spiritual gifts more than any other book in the Bible, chapters 12 and 14. He talks about Christian love in chapter 13. That's a great love chapter. He talks about the Lord's Supper in chapters 10 and 11. He talks about the gospel in chapter 15, and really the resurrection and the gospel are together in chapter 15. Okay. <clears throat> he planted the church on his second missionary journey. You need to remember that. And there were Jews there, and there were Gentiles there, or Greeks. Greeks is just kind of a synonym for Gentiles. They worshipped Aphrodite. You need to remember that, goddess of love and beauty. Venus called, the Romans called her Venus. Venus and Aphrodite are the same goddess, pagan goddess. It was very immoral because she was a goddess of love and fertility and beauty. They had temple prostitutes there, and the men would pay money have sex with the temple prostitutes, and that was disgusting. It was awful, and so God condemned it very strongly. Corinth was even, it was such, such an immoral city. It did so much of that sexual immorality that Corinthianized meant that. It was a slang word to practice sexual immorality. So like they, it was just a common word that they used. It was just a really debauched, ugly, nasty city. Six to 700,000 people, it was a large city. They were also very materialistic. There was a lot of trade going on, a lot of business going on there in Corinth and people making money there. So it sounds like a little bit like an American city, except they were really into this immorality as, a, as an act of worship, they called it. It's, just, it's all silly. It's all foolish. And it was disgusting. But you need to remember those kind of things. So we already said this. He wrote the letter to correct the problems, to bring unity to the church. That's something else you could say, to bring unity. Don't forget that. Correct the problems and bring unity. Written around 55 or 66, end of his third missionary journey from Ephesus. Already said all that. Uh, theme, as we already said this, 316, were temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, here's a question we've not talked about yet. What problem caused quarrels and divisions in the church? They were arguing about who was their leader. Different ones. One sided up based on the leader. Some people said, oh, Paul's my guy. And others said, well, Peter's my guy. And others said, well, no, just Jesus for me. Well, uh, he said, look, we're all supposed to be worshiping the same Jesus. Paul, Apollos, Peter, we're all helping you find Jesus. So don't, don't, get, don't get separating into groups here and quarrel and arguing about that. All right. Now, the things that are underlined, I'm going to go through kind of and mention some of these things. Uh, one of the spiritual gifts he mentioned was the interpretation of tongues. He said some people have tongues. Other people have the gift of interpretation. He also told them, if somebody doesn't, if you don't have somebody that can interpret the tongues, don't speak the tongues in the church. It, it needs to be between you and the Lord alone, unless there's an interpreter in the church. Um, I think I may have shared with you also, I believe these, these tongues are different from the tongues in Acts, because the tongues in Acts didn't need an interpreter. Everybody could understand in their own language. But here in Corinthians, see, the, the tongues they're speaking, they had to have an interpreter. Um, again, where the body of Christ is, is emphasized here, the body has many members, so it is with Christ. We're one body, but we have different parts. You know, a body has hands, feet, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. We're, well, we're all different parts of the body of Christ. We're not the same, we're different. And God uses us in different ways in the body of Christ. Remember that. Then he said, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Now, when he says more excellent way, that's underlined. The more excellent way is love. That will be on the test. You need to remember the more excellent way is not one of the spiritual gifts. It's love that ought to permeate all the spiritual gifts. If we, if we don't have love, love, he said, then your, your gifts are being misused and they're wasted. They're not being used right. you got to have love. Then he said, let everything be done for building up. That means edifying, strengthening. It's supposed to be helping the body of Christ get more like Jesus. Then he mentioned God is not a God of confusion. Don't forget that. He's, a God, he's not a God of confusion, but of peace. All things should be done decently and in order. He didn't want the churches just going crazy and acting silly and, and not doing things and causing confusion and not being in order. Um, he also talked about his coming to Christ when Jesus appeared to him in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I'm the least of the apostles. You need to remember that. That'll be on the test. But what he's talking about is he, he was persecuting the church 
And Jesus appeared to him last of all, after he'd already appeared to everybody else and sent it into heaven, he came and appeared to Paul. And Paul said, I'm the least. I'm the least because I shouldn't even be called apostle, but God calls him an apostle, so I got to accept it because he said I was a persecutor of the church. In chapter 15, he's given the re reasons for understanding the resurrection and the importance of it. He says, if Christ has not been raised, if Jesus stayed in that tomb, then he said, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Notice that's underlined. Your faith is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. So futile, meaningless, in vain, pointless. You need to remember that. That'll be on the test. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Everybody in the world is a descendant of Adam, and we all die because of the sin we inherited from Adam. But in Christ, uh, we, we can be made, given a new life. We become a new creature. We're alive. We're raised with Christ and, and then in, a, in a new spiritual creation. You need to remember that. Then it, also about the resurrection, he said, the body is so imperishable. This body, what, what does perish mean? To die, yeah. He said, You're, these bodies are dying. Everybody knows that. Our bodies are dying. We all know these bodies don't last forever. They're dying. But when it's raised up, it's imperishable. What does imperishable mean? It won't die. The resurrected body we have after Jesus comes back will never die. It's going to live, be eternal, an eternal body, just like his. So he's talking about that in 1 Corinthians 15. You need to remember that and be on the test. And then also the mortal puts on immortality. We're mortal right now. We're dying. Immortality means never die. And then here's another verse for that same chapter near the end. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that our victory is through Jesus. God gives us the victory. And it's through Jesus. So you need to remember that for the test. Hmm. We're just working our way through some of this, weren't we? Uh, and I think that's all the stuff that's on the test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay. Now, let me look at something in my notes back here and see. Make sure I start at the right place. Okay. This is part of that resurrection chapter, but I'm going to start right here and talk about this a little, a little bit more. So you, you got the test down, right? You know what's going to be on the test. You're ready for it. Everybody knows how to study for it. You're not quite ready. You, ready. you need to study. Yeah, you will be ready on Thursday. Okay. All right. So, so here in this resurrection chapter, notice we're kind of far into it now, verse 35. He said, somebody's going to ask me, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come? And he's, you know, in other words, what are we going to be like when we're raised in a new body? And then he, he says, you're being foolish because you can't understand all these things. So, we, we, you know, we can see a little bit of it. But he said, he said, you're really not thinking very well. What you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. First of all, he's comparing it to planting a seed. I think God created plants with seeds so that we could learn about the resurrection. So what do you do with a seed? If you want to grow something, you, 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 you plant it. It looks dead, doesn't it? You with me, Lizzie? It looks dead. The, the seed is a little dead looking thing, a husk it looks like, and you put it down on the ground. But lo and behold, what happens to it? It, it, it? it grows into something pretty amazing. You never know what it's going to be like. If, you, if, you don't, if you're not an, an expert at that sort of thing, you can look at a little dark seed. You say, well, what's it going to be? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know. If it's an apple seed, it's going to turn into an apple tree. If it's a sunflower seed, it's going to turn into a beautiful sunflower. You, know, you can go on down the line with all kinds of seeds. But, but he says, that, that, that seed you sow doesn't come to life unless you, it, you die. It's buried in the ground. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it to bodies. He's chosen to each kind of seed and so bodies. So I was talking about seeds grow up into something that God intends for them to. It's in the DNA of the seed. Not all flesh is the same. There's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one kind. The glory of the earthly is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. Stars differ from star and glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. So he says all this stuff that God's created points to the fact that there's going to be a great resurrection. And when it comes, it's going to be amazing, just like his creation is amazing. And he said, 
it, when, when the resurrection happens, it's going to be sown perishable, a dying perishable body, but it's going to be raised imperishable, a body that will never die. It's sown in dishonor. These bodies are not very honorable, but it's raised in glory. It will be eternal at that point. It'll be like God's Jesus body. It's sown in weakness. These bodies are very weak. It's raised in power. We're going to have power that we can't imagine now in our new bodies. It's sown a natural body. A natural body is a part of nature. It's dying. It's raised a spiritual body. It's going to be a body that will last, last eternally. It'll be spiritual at that point. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. And then he says a little bit later, Behold, I'm telling you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking about death here. Not everybody's going to die in this life, but everybody is going to be changed. He, he didn't know when Jesus was going to come back. But he knew when Jesus came back, the people who are alive would just be changed immediately. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet is kind of like a quick death. And then you're suddenly in the, in the, in the presence of Jesus. For the trumpet will sound... And the dead will be raised imperishable, never to die again. We shall be changed, those who are alive and remain. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable, that is the dying, puts on the imperishable, the non-dying, the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that's written, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus defeated death on the cross. He came out of that tomb and proved he defeated death. And when we come out of that tomb, we'll see that our death will be swallowed up in victory too. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, after he says all this about the resurrection and all this about our future, he says, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. You know what that means? Steadfast? Yes, thank you. Don't quit. Have you heard me say stay in the battle? That's what I mean. Be steadfast. Immovable. We have that one. You remember this verse, don't you? Immovable. That means, I, I said, I use the example of a rock on a trail. It's a monstrous boulder and you can't move. God wants us to be firm, to stand firm. Don't be moved by the people in the world who reject God. Don't let them mess you up. You stay firm. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Keep doing the work that he's given you to do. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In vain means what? Yep, a, a wasted effort. That's good. That's good. Yeah, and, and he says, he says that's, that's not what we're doing. He says it's not wasted. It's not. It's not just to say you're doing something. It's it's going to bear fruit. God's going to use it. Your labor's not in vain. You might not see it. You may see it later. You may see it in eternity. But just remember, it's not in vain. It's a promise. He's got a purpose for it. This is going back to chapter 1. Now, that was chapter 15, so that's later in the book. But I'm going back to chapter 1 here because I think there's important things here I want us to see. This is part of God's Word. He's just talked about the fact that they've been arguing and dividing up. He says, don't do that. because. And then he says, you got to realize something. The word of the cross is folly. You know what folly means? It's... It, it, Yeah, or, or foolish, or silly, folly. You know. So, so to people, to those who are perishing, that means the people who haven't trusted Jesus, they t they hear us talking about the cross and Jesus dying on the cross, and they get silly. That's foolish. That doesn't make any sense to them. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. We know what He did, and we know why He did it, and it's it's the power that's changed us and made us into new creatures. So we know. But they don't. For it's written, I will just, God says this, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. It's the same thing we're talking about in Romans. They think they're wise, but they're really not. God's going to destroy that so-called wisdom. And the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. God's not going to let them get by with their foolishness. Where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Yes, he has. They may think it's wise, but it's really fools. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to say those who believe. And he's using that word kind of in quotes. They call it folly, but of course it's not really folly. Jews demand signs. Jews, Jews kept saying, show us some miracles, show us some signs, do some mighty words. They kind of like want to see some magic tricks and stuff. 
That, that was what they kept asking Jesus. They wanted to do magic tricks. Jews do many signs. Greeks seek wisdom. You know, Greeks were famous for their philosophers. And they had a lot of philosophers who had a lot of, quote, deep thinking. But they left God out for the most part. So it's really not as deep as it seems. It seems deep. It seems profound. But it's foolish. We preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. They didn't, they didn't believe their Messiah would be a crucified Savior. They, they, they want him to be a ruler of Rome, overthrow Rome. Foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So power and wisdom are in Jesus, not in these worldly ways of thinking. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So men may call it foolish and weak, but it's, it's much stronger than, than anything they can do. They're the ones that are foolish and weak. And then look at this verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, you look at Christians, and, and God often chooses people who the world thinks don't have much to offer. The world thinks, these are kind of weak people. These are dumb people. These are ignorant people. That's how the world sees us a lot of times. They see us as foolish. But God says, that's who he's chosen. And he's going to use the foolish people to confound the people who are wise. He's going to eventually show that we were the wise ones by trusting him. And he wants people, he wants the world to know that. And that way, he said, you won't boast. We don't brag much when we realize, man, I'm weak. <clears throat> I don't have much to offer. God's strong. I'm weak. And so when I realize that, God can use me to do some exciting things. He, he works through weak vessels. That way he gets the glory. Paul seems to be an example, a, 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 a contradiction to that, because Paul was really smart. Uh, he was a, on the Sanhedrin, which was where all the brilliant Jewish leaders were. I mean, the great men, there were just a few of them on the Sanhedrin. Paul was in that group. He was, he was headed for great greatness as a Jew. He was highly educated. But you know what he said about all that? He said, I had to count that stuff like garbage and dung because God didn't need my education. God didn't need my what I had to offer. I needed God. He didn't need me. And so when Paul realized that he himself had to recognize that he was weak too, then God could use him. And that's the way God works. So he can use people that seem to be strong or seem to be highly educated or seem to be gifted. God can use those kind of people. But before he does, they have to say, Lord, I know I don't have anything you need. I'm not smart. I need you. I'm, I'm foolish without you. I'm dumb without you. So please use me as you see fit. And when they do that, then, then God can use them too. All right. This is in chapter 8. And I think this is important because he's talking about a principle here that uh, causes a lot of Christians to, to be confused and have some problems with each other. He said, now concerning food offered to idols, that probably means they had, they had, you know that letter I told you he'd gotten? <coughs> probably means in that letter, they said, okay, Paul, is it okay to eat food that's been offered to idols or not? Because some of us think it's okay and some of us don't. So tell us, is it okay or not? Well, here's what he said. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. But he said, you got to be really careful. Knowledge puffs up. You know what that means? What he means by that when he says knowledge puffs up? Guess. What, what's, what's a puffed up person like? Yeah, they're proud. They're arrogant. They think they're good. And he said, be careful. Knowledge will make you that way. You know, if, if you've ever seen somebody who's kind of stuck on themselves thinking they know more than anybody else, they think they're really smart. He says, that's what, that's what knowledge can do to you. It can make you feel really smart and puff you up. Love is what builds people up. You don't want to get puffed up. You want to be built up. So, so be sure you focus on love, not knowledge. But it's true. Uh, you know, he's going to say in a minute that, that we know. I mean, he says there. We know the truth about these food altar items. Be careful with it. He says, because you've got to have love here. 
So he says, if anyone imagines he knows something, he doesn't yet know as he ought to know. Be careful about your knowledge. Recognize that you don't know as much as you think you do. None of us do. We're all weak compared to what the true knowledge is of God. You know, we, we're all just kind of small and we need him to show us the way. But if anyone loves God, there's the love thing. He is known by God. God wants us to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment of all. So now he's going to get down to the question. Therefore, as to the eating food offered to idols, that was the question. We know that an idol has no real existence. We know that. We know that those are just idols. Those are just false gods. We know there's only one God that's true. There's no God but one. We know that. He said, there, there may be so-called gods in heaven or earth, as indeed there are many gods, many lords, but he puts them all in quotes. You know, there are lots of people called different things, gods and lords. Yet for us, there's one God, the Father, from whom are all things and from, for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. He said, some people don't quite get it here about these other idols and things not being really meaningful. And so, because they, they, they think those gods are some, lesser gods of some kind, he said, but some, through former association with idols, in other words, they used to worship those idols. And some of them thought those idols were real little gods. So, so they were associated with those idols, and now they've given it up, but, but they, they eat food that's really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. They think, that's been offered to a false god, and if I eat it, I'm participating in that, and I don't want to do that, and so I, I feel bad about that. I don't want to do it. And Paul said, hey, some people can eat it, and it's not a problem. It's not, they don't care. It's just an idol. I, I can eat it. But some people eat it, and they think, oh, my goodness, I shouldn't have eaten that. That's, that's, that's food that's offered to an idol. Now, he goes on and says, listen, guys. He said, remember this. Food is not going to commend us to God. You're no worse off if you don't eat. You're no better off if you do eat. Don't, don't get hung up on food here. But listen, he says, take care that this right of yours doesn't somehow become a stumbling block to others, to weak. For if anyone who sees you have knowledge, in other words, you might say, hey, I know there's nothing wrong with eating this meat. I'm going to eat it. And then one of the weaker brothers who thinks there is something wrong with it, they see you eating it. Will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? So he must well, I guess if he can eat it, I can, but, it's, but he still feels like it's wrong. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. They're sinning against God because they're violating their conscience. The brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll never eat meat. Let's make my brother stumble. He's saying, look, if, I'm, if I've got a brother in Christ and they think it's wrong to eat that meat, even though I know it's okay to eat that meat, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to create a problem for them. So the meat's not a trivial thing. He said, I'm just, I'm just not going to do it. So he might eat it in the privacy of his home. He might eat it when that other person's not around. But if that person's around and he knows he's going to offend him, nope, no thanks. I'm not going to eat it. He's not going to cause a problem. Can you think of anything that's going on like that today? We don't have meat sacrificed to idols that people worry about much. Can you think of anything else that people might disagree about sometimes about whether it's right or wrong? And smoking, maybe. Yeah, there are a lot of us who feel like, hey, that's bad for your body. You shouldn't be doing that. And some well, alcohol is another one. Some people think, man, you shouldn't drink at all. You need to be totally abstain from alcohol because it's bad for your body. And other people say, well, as long as I don't get drunk, I think it's okay. And God's God's telling us, hey, be careful. Don't 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 flaunt your Freedom, but don't offend people easily. You know, if people feel offended, don't do it. Don't say, you, you, get, you get over that. You know, just, just be careful. Yes, Lizzie. Okay. Uh, yeah. Bye bye. What's that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, t let me tell you what I think about, about the gay issue. And I think we have to be careful about all these issues. Sometimes God speaks very clearly about things, and we have to agree with God so in that issue I think it's an issue where we we say okay I know they're, they're creating your image God and I, I'm going to love them but I also know that you say very clear if you don't know this you know I can show you in God's word but God's word is very clear that that really is sinful behavior so they shouldn't be doing it and so if they're doing it anyway and they think they're doing it, it's okay with God that's one of those things that we got to be careful about saying well that's okay for example, let's take another issue, abortion. 
abortion is killing little babies. There's some people that feel like that they're willing to abort their babies because they don't think there's anything wrong with it. And uh, but 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 we know that's that's killing a baby. That should you shouldn't do that. So we love them, but we don't say, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. It does matter what you believe. So there's some issues that we have to stand firm on. There could be people who would say, uh, for example, uh, I don't care if, if I don't think Jesus cares if I use God's name in vain. And they start using God's name just as a byword. Just, you know, just when they get excited, they use God's name. And we know that's sinful. And so we say, you know, I appreciate what, you, you know, I know God loves you, but but you got to think about the way you're using God's name. There are certain things that really are sinful. Eating meat sacrificed to idols is not a sinful, but some people think it is. You see the difference there? So you got you got to study God's word to find out what's really right and wrong. So homosexual behavior is definitely a sin. Abortion is definitely a sin. Uh, drinking alcohol, though, is, is maybe a good example of something that's questionable. Because when you study the Bible real carefully, uh, God definitely condemns drunkenness. Drunkenness is a sin. But it, it's not as clear that drinking short of getting drunk is a sin. So, you know, he, he mentions that, in fact, in this. He says about drinking wine. He says, if it offends my brother, I'm not going to drink it. Which implies that he might drink it in other cases. So, uh, these are difficult things. There, there was a time, this is not, well, I guess it's sort of true now. There was a time when people... Back in the early 20th century, you know, like 100 years ago, there were a lot of Christians who felt like it was very, very wrong to go to any movie. It was wrong to go to a movie, period. You know why they thought that? Okay, partly maybe because it wasn't real. That's a good thought. Yep. And yeah, sometimes there were bad words in there. And they said, that's awful. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. That's right. Um. Uh, yeah, sometimes what gory things sometimes and sometimes sinful stuff was going on in the movies. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they would say, well, these people don't seem to care about God at all. They're just they're living lives without God. And so, and you know, because the movies don't talk about God much. And so they, they think that they're just they're, there were there was a time when people thought it was wrong to read novels. Some people did, not everybody. But some Christians thought it was wrong to read novels. Even even novels that were basically pretty good because they thought, well, we ought to be reading God's word, not novels. Well, if a person, if I, you know, that's kind of silly now, but if somebody now said, Steve, I don't, I don't feel good about reading that, these novels, then I might say, well, I understand, and, and I'm not, I don't want to be offensive, you know, so, I, so at least when they're around, I'm not going to be reading a novel. I'm not going to try to create a problem. I might gently try to help them see that maybe it's okay. But, listen, guys, this gets more complicated. You realize that some movies... Many movies are basically okay, but they throw a few bad words in there, or they throw a little bit of sex in there, or something like that, you know, or a little bit of gore in there. Not much, just a little bit. And we think, well, that doesn't bother me too much. I think I can watch that. And then there are other movies that have a little bit more, and there are other movies that have a little bit more, and there are other movies that have a lot. You see what I'm getting at here? And 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 I tell you what, I've told my grandchildren before. You know, they'll be watching a movie. And, and if I'm watching it with them, I don't watch many, many movies with them anymore. But when they were little, I did. <laughs> and I would, I would say, now, what I need you to do is if you recognize something in that movie that you know God wouldn't be pleased with, tell me. You know, talk to me about it. So what would happen is we'd be watching the movie and they'd hear a word. And I, if I'm sitting over here, they'd go, <laughs> you know, like, I heard that, Grandpa. You know, they recognize it. And I'd say, you're right. That's not pleasing God. Now, I didn't make them quit watching the movie just because there was one bad word. Or maybe even two. But sometimes if it just got to be out of hand, I said, whoa, it's going too far. You know, there, there's too much. I don't, I don't want to. We're not going to watch that. That's getting too raunchy. You see what I'm getting at here? Those are decisions we have to make. And some people might be able to watch a little more raunch <laughs> than somebody else and not be bothered by it. Some people might say, oh, it's not, I'm not going to I'm not going to do this sin. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not I know it's sinful. I know it's wrong. I'm not going to be persuaded that it's OK. But it's, I can still watch the movie and enjoy it. And, and you have to, we have to give each other a little bit of room there, you know, because we might disagree. I might say, how can you watch this stuff? It's awful. And somebody else says, oh, come on, Steve. It's not that big a deal. You see what I'm getting at here? There are differences in Christians. You're still kids, and you have to listen to your parents when it comes to that kind of stuff because they will help you make good decisions right now. But later on, 
you'll make more of your own decisions. But even now, you need to be sensitive about that kind of thing. It'd be good for you every now and then to say, okay, Lord, this movie's gone too far. I'm turning it off, you know, and just, just, just walk away from it sometimes. I know. I, yeah. Uh, I, I'll hold that thought, Bill. Uh, I think I'm with you. Uh, I don't like to watch it for one thing. But I also think, you know, God says very clearly, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear. I don't want you to be afraid. And I think if people are watching horror movies because they somehow get a kick out of the adrenaline rush that comes from fear, that doesn't sound like it's very godly to me. You know, I think I don't, I'm not sure that's what God wants us to do. I got to be careful about judging my brothers and sisters, but I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't, I don't think it's healthy. Bill, you start to say something else. No. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Okay. Uh, can we be done? Yeah, we can go get some food. I'm already finished with this slide. <laughs> wait a minute. Let's see. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me see what I got on the next slide. Yeah, that's about the Lord's Supper. Um, let's see. Let me look at this. Let's see if I want to say anything else about this. But you get the point, right? There, there are things that are kind of questionable. And we need to be careful about judging our brothers and sisters. There are other things that are just clearly sin. If somebody, here's, let me use this in a ridiculous example. But if somebody came along and said, I don't think murder is such a big deal. I mean, yeah, I've killed a few people. <laughs> you, and, and you wouldn't say, well, i got to give them a little room here. You know, I mean, I, you wouldn't do that, would you? You'd say, That's, no, it's wrong. It's horrible. Or somebody said, I don't think adultery is that big a deal. you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. God says it's a big deal. Uh, you know, the same thing with drunkenness, you know, all kinds of things like that. So we got to recognize that it turns out in our day that there are people trying to say, I know this is very common. They're trying to say, well, homosexuality is really not sin. But God says it is. So I got to side with God with these things. That doesn't mean I quit loving them. I love them. I, wanna, I want what's best for them. But I have to be honest with them about what God says. It, it fits in the category of sin. Uh, let me look just one more minute here. If there's anything else I want to see, how many pages I got? Oh, there's two more. Let's see. Let's, let's read this, and then I'll stop. This is chapter 13. You remember what chapter 13 is all about, First Corinthians? Um, no, that's, that's 11. It's, it's love. It's about love. Yeah, it's love. Let, let's, let's listen to what, just listen to what God has to say about love here, and I'll let you go. If I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, in other words, if I have the gift of tongues, but have not love... I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making a bunch of noise. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, in other words, you know God's word, you know God's truth. And if I have all faith so I can move mountains, if I've got faith so that God can work through me to accomplish things, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. He says, it may seem like a great thing, but if you don't have love in your faith, the faith is, is useless. If I give away all I have, these are people's spiritual gift of giving. Even if I deliver my body to be burned. But if I don't have love, it's not worth anything. Love is the foundation for all of this. And then he describes love. Love is patient. Are you patient with people? Yeah. Love is kind. Yeah. Love does not envy or boast. It doesn't envy what other people have. Say, I ought to have that. It doesn't boast. Look what I've got. Look what I've done. It's not arrogant. That's that bragging on yourself. It's not rude. It's gracious. It's kind. It's doesn't insist on its own way. Listen, how many times do we do that? That's not loving. We say, no, we're going to do it my way. That's not loving. It's not irritable. How many times do we get irritated at people? It's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. That's what we ought to be rejoicing in God's truth. And then look at this, guys. Love bears all things. That means you go through the difficult times. Believes all things. We never quit believing. We just trust God all the way through. Hopes all things. We know things are going to turn we're not good in the end. We have hope. Endures all things. We just we, we know God will get us through it. And it never ends. Look at this. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. There's coming a time when prophecies will end. For tongues, they'll cease too. As for knowledge, it's going to pass away, human knowledge. But we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, that's when Jesus comes back, and we're in these new bodies we're talking about earlier. The partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. You guys are kind of in the in-between stage right now. You're coming out of childhood into adulthood. You still speak like children sometimes. It's all right. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But listen, he said, when I grew up, when I became a man or a woman, if it was a woman, but he's a man, I gave up childish ways. I said, okay, i got to think like an adult. For now, right now, 
we see in a mirror dimly. Right now, we don't, we don't understand things very well. The mirrors they had back then were not really clear like ours are. They, they, they've got a very rough image. But then, when Jesus comes back face to face, now I know in part. I, there's a lot I don't know. Then I'm going to know a lot more. I'll know fully, even if I've been fully known. He knows me fully. One of these days, he's going to let me see things. So he says, here, here are three things. That, that are faith, hope, and love. All three of these are really important. Faith, hope, and love. Faith means trusting God. Hope means knowing the future is going to be good. God's going to do everything he said he's going to do. We know we're going to be there one of these days with him. And love, of course, you know what love is. It's, it's love is doing God's commands, really, but it's loving God with all your heart, loving others as yourself. Those are the three things. But he said the greatest of them is love. So it's an awesome chapter. Someday somebody might want to memorize it. It's 13 verses. It's worth memorizing. Okay. Anything else you want to say? Yes. Some some people what now? Like, uh, some people are dosing my like, parents' games. Apparently. I don't think I know what you're talking about, person. And, huh? I'm sorry. I, I'm not trying to be ugly. I just don't understand what you mean. Uh, some people are dosing my parents' games. Dosing? I don't know what that word means. Uh, it's like uh, when you like uh, use some type of client to shut somebody's like uh, servers off, like internet. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so they're messing with the game somehow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and uh, apparently, and some were not making like, a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Fast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I'm not sure all that means, but all right. No. So doxing is basically like they're interfering with it, messing it up, so it doesn't come out like it's supposed to, like 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 playing a trick on you, so you don't your game doesn't work like you're supposed to or something. So yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah. So doxing is like a. So you know how servers use internet, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes like a. Someone can use like a doxing client to turn off somebody's internet. So uh, Okay, so they're messing up with your internet service. Yeah, okay. I got it. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, well, I appreciate that. You guys raised me to pray? Father, thank you for these. Would you, did you start saying something, Mia? Okay, it looked like your hand was going up. Okay, Father, thank you for, for all your blessings. Thank you for these kids. Thank you for the time we've had in your word. Lord, your word is truth, and we know that, and we know that some of your word is difficult for us to understand, so help us to be good students to study your word and try our best to understand it. I pray it help these kids to learn the things they need to learn for the test coming up Thursday and help them do well on the test, help them to not just blow it off, but to get ready and memorize the things they need to memorize so they'll be ready. And I pray you'd help them do well. Lord, you know what's going on that Preston was trying to describe about the games his parents are playing and the way people are interfering on the internet. We just put that in your hands and ask you to give wisdom for everybody concerned to do the right thing and protect them. Lord, help us to bless you the rest of the day. Help us to walk with you. Help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to be good listeners. Help us to be encouragers. Help us to bless others. Help us to love the way you want us to love. Most of all, help us to bring you glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.